extienda su amor y te muestre el favor. Dios te mire con agrado y te dé paz. Amén. Amén. right now with all that is going on the platform is set for you to show that your presence knows no bounds and when your word comes to pass let us not be the ones to miss you for your spirit and your word reign supreme to every issue for there's nothing new under the sun that your son hasn't overcome and when we begin to make room there's no capacity that your presence can't exceed for you're a god that not only knows but meets every need There's no depth that you won't go and no distance that you can't cross. No mess that you can't clean and no dark place that your light cannot gleam. May they know that the Father's heart plays no small part from start to finish. They know that you're a God with no limits. From nation to nation, from this generation to the next, let your will be done even after the record reflects. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children
The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. And yet, their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey straight from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults and keep me also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord my rock and my redeemer, Psalm 19. Verse 5. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. No none can compare with you. Were I to speak until liberty, they would be too many to declare. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you have planned for us. None can compare with you. I to speak and tell of your deeds, there would be too many to declare. Psalm 40, verse 5. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. John 40, verse 5. Were I to speak, were I to speak, tell of your deeds. What? They would be. They would be too many to quit. Some boy, boy, but back. Very good.
Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. We're so glad you could make it. Even though we haven't been able to gather together physically, it's been pretty great knowing that we can still gather together virtually, jointly lifting our hearts and our, our prayers to God. We're going to be starting a new series today. It's going to be centered on the New Testament book of Philemon. We'll also be participating in communion. Please make sure you have some bread and some juice so that you can partake in the Lord's Supper with us. If you have any prayer requests, you can send those to office at trivalleychurch.org. Or if you'd like to connect with someone right now and have them pray for you, you can hit the live prayer button that's located in the chat. We'd like to encourage you to continue to give during this time, and you can do that in two ways. The first is sending your contribution to the church building. The second is going on the website at trivalleychurch.org slash giving. As we enter into our time of worship together, I'd like to leave you with these words from Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples, for great is his steadfast love toward us and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord.
Spiritual formation and growth happen best when people connect to the Lord in three areas. One, on your own, two, with partners, and three, in the church. Throughout this year, we're going to highlight some examples of different ways that you can connect in each of these three areas. Today, I want to share a great opportunity to do the second one, connect with partners through regular check-in times with other Christians, and that is our discipleship groups. We're offering some weekly discipleship groups this fall that will meet on Zoom. Now these small groups are designed to help you grow spiritually as we learn to trust and follow Jesus, connect with other Christians, and learn to practice the discipline of praying for one another. So if you'd like to be part of one of these groups, you can find the sign-up link on our website. Just go to trivalleychurch.org slash adults. And stay tuned here for more ways that you can connect with the Lord.
I think most of us are familiar with the story where Peter disowns Jesus. At the Last Supper, that final Passover meal Jesus celebrated with his apostles, Jesus tells his followers to remember him by partaking of what we call communion. Shortly thereafter, he tells them his betrayal and crucifixion is at hand. Peter boldly states that he will follow Jesus to prison and even death if necessary. But Jesus already knows that's not the case. In Luke 22:34, we read, Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Picking up the story in Luke 22, verse 54, we see what happened when Jesus was arrested just a short time later. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But Peter denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. I've often read this passage and imagine what that look Jesus gave Peter after the rooster crowed must have looked like. I usually see an image of anger or perhaps disgust in Jesus' eyes, or maybe that condemning, condemning look of righteous indignation that says, I told you so. Whether it was the look or the rooster crowing, we know that Peter came to a realization of what he had done and it made him very sad. But I think these images of the expression on the face of Jesus are probably wrong. Jesus already knew that Peter would deny him, and he'd probably already come to terms with that, so I don't think there was anger, disgust, or con condemnation in that look. I think it was a look of mercy and compassion. A look that said what happened right now does not define or alter our relationship. Jumping back in the story, back to verse 31, Jesus had told Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. When we come to the table to take of the Lord's Supper, we come into the presence of that same Jesus, a Jesus who looks at us with mercy and compassion, a Jesus who reminds us that he prayed for us, a Jesus who wants to be in a relationship with us. So as we partake of the bread representing the body of Jesus, and the, as we drink from the cup that represents the blood he shed for our sins, Remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. And Father, we thank you for this simple ceremony that helps us to remember Jesus, to remember our Lord and Savior. Father, we're thankful that when you look at us, you look with mercy, that you look with compassion, and that you offer forgiveness. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So when I was a kid, we used to play this card game called President. Everyone is dealt playing cards and you try to play the highest card. Whoever gets rid of all of their cards first is the president. Then the second person out is the vice president and so on down to the second to last person is called the scum. And then at the very bottom, the loser is the super scum. It's a fun game. Uh, and at the end of every round, everyone gets to declare their status. I'm the president. Oh, I'm the scum. And then you arrange yourselves in chairs accordingly. The president gets to choose the comfiest chair uh, and then gets to take the best cards out of the hand of the super scum. In this game, everyone knows everyone else's status. And if you're on the top, the rules of the game favor you so that it's easy to stay on top. Well, this game pretty accurately parallels what life was like in the ancient Roman world. Status was everything. The whole goal in Roman society was to give yourself greater honor, more respect, and be able to climb that social ladder. Everyone knew everyone else's status. At the top of the list, we had the nobles, and then you had senators. After them were the equestrians, the military horse people, then regional magistrates and senators, then freeborn Roman citizens, then freed slaves, and at the very bottom rung, making up 30% of Roman society, was the super scum, and that was the slaves. But Jesus came into this world and he didn't play that game. He didn't clamor for social position, and he showed love and grace to all people, and he encouraged his followers to take the downward path of the servant rather than the upward road to Roman glory. But the first century obsession with power and status was one of Christianity's biggest obstacles. Paul is constantly pushing back against this mentality that was ingrained in people since their birth. When one's new identity as a follower in Christ clashes with the status-focused values of the Roman world, there's going to be some tension. And so some of the things that Paul asks Christians and churches to do seem very strange and foreign to them. And that's what we're going to get in Paul's letter to Philemon. Paul is going to ask Philemon to do something that no one had ever asked him to do before. Now, we don't know the full story of what happened, but we can piece it together from this letter and some of the other sources that we have. Onesimus was a slave in Philemon's house, uh, and they lived in Colossae, and Onesimus ran away, possibly stealing money or so, some items when he left for his journey. Onesimus travels about 100 miles away and comes across Paul, who is in prison in Ephesus. And Paul shares the gospel with Onesimus, and Onesimus becomes a Christian. This is great. And as much as Paul would have loved for Onesimus to stay with him and have this new friend and brother in Christ, Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon, along with Paul's friend Tychicus, and he sends him with a letter. Now, this is kind of surprising. We might wonder, why didn't Paul protect Onesimus? Maybe he could have sent him off to do missionary work in Greece instead of sending him back to the house where he was enslaved, the place he ran away from. Slaves were often not treated well in the ancient world. And we're going to talk about that more next week. If a slave ran away, they could be branded on the face or they might have to wear an iron shackle around their neck. And oftentimes, if a runaway slave was found, they were simply crucified to send a message to the other slaves who were thinking about running away. So Paul sending Onesimus back is kind of a risky move. But it seems like a risk that Paul is willing to take for the sake of the gospel. Paul is betting on Philemon responding in a Christ-like way and doing something revolutionary. So we're going to listen in on the letter that Paul sends to Philemon this morning. But we need to keep some things in mind about how letters were shared in the ancient world. It's not exactly like they are today. A letter probably wouldn't have been just read privately by Philemon. It would have been read aloud in front of his whole household. And since this particular letter is addressed to the church that meets in Philemon's house, they might have gathered the whole church to hear this letter as well. Free people, slave people, family members, church people. And it would have been read by Tychicus, but he would have read it in Paul's voice. Paul would have coached Tychicus on how to say it, where to look, emphasize certain words at certain points during the reading of the letter. And the people in the household would not have just listened quietly. They would have interacted with this message from Paul as it was being read. They might cheer or boo at certain points, and they might ask questions of the reader or ask him to repeat a certain line. And I want you to keep these things in mind as we hear this letter this morning. Philemon is going to get instructions from Paul, and everyone is there watching him. They all knew that Onesimus had run away, and they probably knew the reason why. 
And now this letter arrives, not delivered by the FedEx carrier that you don't know his name, but it's delivered by Onesimus himself, along with Paul's trusted friend, Tychicus. What's going to happen? Let's find out. So I'm going to be Tychicus this morning, and I'm going to read the letter from Paul to Philemon, but I want you to interact with it the way that Philemon's household and the church that met there would have done. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to divide everybody into two different camps. There's going to be the Philemon camp and the Onesimus camp. So if your last name has an odd number of letters, then you're a slave. Sorry, you're the super scum of society. That's just the hand you've been dealt. There's nothing you can do about it. Odd number of letters in your last name, you're a slave. But that means that you're a supporter of Onesimus. And if you hear something in the letter that says something positive about Onesimus, I want you to make some noise. You can clap your hands. You can say, yeah, right on. If you hear something that you can relate to as a slave, like Paul being a prisoner himself, you can make some noise for that as well. But if your last name has an even number of letters, then you're a free person in Philemon's household, and you're a big supporter of Philemon. If you hear something in the letter that makes Philemon sound good, then you make some noise. Clap your hands or say, right on, yeah, that's my guy. So let's practice this. Let me hear from my Onesimus supporters. Yay! Okay, now how about my Philemon people? Yay! Good. All right, let's hear this letter together. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Wow, Philemon sounded like a pretty good guy so far. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Here's what Paul's doing here. He's buttering him up. He's making him look good. And then here comes the hard request. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is none other than Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Let's hear it for Onesimus. Yeah, yeah, you like that guy. Who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me, so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated for you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, but no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. (laughs) Not to mention it. He wasn't going to mention it. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing you will do even more than I ask. There's one more thing. And one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, as do, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So Philemon is left standing there with all eyes on him. And every person is wondering, what is he going to do? 
Is he going to punish Onesimus? Is he going to set him free? Is he going to send him to work with Paul? Or will he do the thing that Paul requests? Will he welcome him back, no longer as a slave, but as a dear brother in Christ? Lately, I've been reading The Cat in the Hat to Leah and Lucy during their bedtime. Uh, It's a great book by Dr. Seuss. It's really fun to read out loud. It's the story of these two kids who are left home alone by their mother. And while the mother's gone, this crazy cat shows up and makes a big mess in the house with all these crazy games. You might remember this story. You might remember some of the antics of the cat. He balances the fishbowl on his head, and then he releases thing one and thing two, and they make a mess of the house. Well, the story ends with the cat leaving and everything getting cleaned up a split second before their mother comes back home. And the mother asks the two kids what they did all day. And the book ends with these words. Should we tell her about it? Now, what should we do? Well, what would you do if your mother asked you? Philemon ends on a similar cliffhanger. Not just, what should Philemon do? But what would you do if Paul asked you? It's not just a fun thought exercise. This book points to the expectation that the gospel changes worlds. That becoming a Christian and living the way of Jesus requires you to think differently and act differently and make decisions differently than you would have otherwise. In Roman culture, status was everything. So before becoming a Christian, Philemon's main concern would have been, how do I save face in this situation? How do I get my household in order by the current standard of my peers and my colleagues? But Paul is persuading him to make love and reconciliation his main concern. And that might require Philemon to relinquish power and authority and to forgive instead of punish. And to go against the whole system of the power dynamics that was standard in Roman society. Instead of it being about status, it becomes about family. Scott McKnight says that Paul is challenging Philemon to change his status-shaped community into a sibling-shaped community, which was unheard of back then. No one ever would have recommended treating your slave, the super scum of society, like your brother, like your equal in this situation. But there it is. What would you do if Paul asked you? The way of Christ requires Paul and Philemon and us to deny our own rights and privileges for the sake of others. Jesus puts it like this. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. The book of Philemon is not just theology, the study of God and his ways. It's theopraxis, the practice of the way of God. Not just what the gospel is, but what it does and how it impacts your life. Does it make you more loving and more forgiving? Does it empower and influence you to make hard decisions that might actually cost you something? Well, we're going to let this letter challenge us for the next few weeks. We're going to dive deeper into the nuances and the implications of Philemon and ask ourselves, how can the gospel challenge and change our lives in similar ways? We're going to look at what it means to relinquish power and authority. We're going to see the call for Christians to be welcoming and forgiving and to be reconcilers. We're going to talk about the sticky subject of slavery and power structures and our role in that. And we're going to see that following Jesus leads us to a new way of living, new life, and being a total new creation. And so in preparation for the rest of this series, I want you to prepare your heart this week. Ask yourself, how is the gospel changing the way that you respond in tricky situations like this one? You might also take some time and ask yourself, who do I have power over? Your first reaction to that question might be, no one. I don't, I don't wield power. I don't have any power. But remember, power comes in a lot of forms. You might have seniority in your job. You may have more wealth than your neighbor has. You may have better social skills than someone else. You may have power or authority over someone else's finances. Are you a parent? My guess is you have some authority there. Do you interact with minimum wage workers? Be honest with yourself about your status and try to put yourself in Philemon's shoes and understand how hard it will be to do something that you don't want to do and that you don't have to do. What's it going to cost you? 
Each week after the sermon, I put a set of discipleship questions on our church website. Now, these are questions designed to help you interact with the Sunday message and the, and the scriptures. They're questions that our discipleship groups will be discussing, but you can also use these questions as conversation starters with the people that you live with, people in your household. You can break these out at the dinner table or when you're with your spouse or your roommate. They're designed for you to apply the principles of the sermon text to your life so that uh, you'll be more shaped by the gospel in your daily living in the same way that Paul hoped Philemon would be. So it's an important way to grow in faith and Christian maturity. Uh, and it's connecting with God through partners. That's, that's number two of our one, two, three connect. So consider making this growth area a regular part of your week. I'm excited for this series. I'm glad that you're all on board with, with this, and I'm going to be praying for you throughout it. Let me close this out in prayer now. Lord God, we thank you for these words of wisdom, these words that didn't just speak to certain people at a certain time, but continue to speak to us today. And we ask that you will open up our hearts to you and to what you want us to know as we read Paul's words to Philemon, Paul's challenge to be Christ-like in a situation where he may not want to be, a situation where he feels wronged, a call to be forgiving, a call to show more concern for someone who society doesn't care about. That's the kind of people we want to be, Lord. That's our prayer this morning. Let us treat others with love and respect that goes beyond just what is expected or what is required. Let us live to that higher standard of Christ. We pray that your kingdom will come and your will be done here on earth the way that it's done in heaven. And may we be a part of helping that happen. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.